right. Welcome back. To Polo uh -oh. to Gatun. Turn you off. Okay. So, last time we talked about arrays. And that was exciting because arrays really dramatically expanded the kinds of data that we could work with as a computer scientist. So now I can not only store single values, but I can work with series of values in order of the same kind. And while there are some limitations associated with Java arrays, it turns out that there's a surprisingly large amount of data that we can store um, as a series of values of the same kind. We can represent music, we can represent text, we can represent the human genome, we can represent, you know, a great deal of the recorded history of our species and a lot of information about what's going on around us in the world. But we didn't get a lot of practice using those, so that's one of the things we're gonna talk about today. Um, we started to look at some uh, new Java constructs that we use to access and work with data in arrays, something called a loop. Although the loops we've looked at, we've mainly been talking about kind of how to set them up and how to get them to loop a certain number of times. We haven't talked about, you know, how to use them to access data in arrays, and that's what we're going to do today. And then that's gonna naturally lead us in the direction of starting to talk about a little bit more about what all this is for, you know? Um, we've been talking about these very, uh, simple and basic building blocks, super important stuff. I mean, again, all of the really interesting things that computer science is doing in the world are grounded on these foundations. But there's more that we can do. And so we'll start talking about algorithms. We're gonna do some, introduce the idea of algorithm, which is a very specific way of solving a problem. And algorithms, in many ways, are very associated with computers. We're talking about computer algorithms, and I'll show you that the usage of the word algorithm is heavily associated with the computer era. So a lot of times, what we're, the algorithms that we divide, design and develop, we're really doing that because we want to run them on a computer. So we'll start talking about that. So this is fun. On Monday, we'll actually start to talk about how we can encapsulate those algorithms in a unit of programming logic called a function. But let's start off by reviewing arrays. So last time, we looked at a lot of new things. Today is more of a chance for us to uh, step back and kind of solidify some of that knowledge, okay? So a Java array represents one or more values, zero or more values of the same type. Now again, it's unusual to create an empty Java array, but I can do that if I want. It allows me to take a series of data and structure it. So this was our first example of a data structure. It takes a bunch of integers or a bunch of characters and structures them, it puts them in order. And in many cases, again, you can think about a book, right? If I take all the letters that you need to write, you know, any famous book, and I just jumble them up, I don't have the book anymore, right? What makes a poem, what makes a novel, what makes the human genome is order, not just the building blocks. It's only four characters in the human genome. But put enough of those in order, and I get an organism, something incredibly complex and mysterious and strange. Okay, so arrays are our ch first chance to do that, right? Allows us to work with structured data in Java. Oh, okay, that's not gonna happen. It's weird, it happened once, okay? Will it happen again? We'll see. Um, so arrays put values in order, right? One, maybe it's one of you testing out some sort of system that you're gonna use to defeat me in the future, right? It works, right? We're two for two now. Um, all right, so arrays put values in order, um, and the val so once I put data into an array, I've associated a new piece of information which e with each piece of, of data that I've added to the array. It has a position. So before, it was just a letter, but now it has a position. You know, it's somewhere in the book, it's somewhere in the poem, right? And that position is important, as are the positions of all the other uh, pieces of data that are part of it. So Java has syntax that allows me to declare that I'm gonna work with data that's stored in an array. And we looked at this, this is, you know, oh, I have the same bug as last time, I fixed it on last time's slides, but not today, I'll fix it again today. Please don't do that. All right, there we go. So, single value, a single integer value, that's how I declare it on line two. If I want to declare an array, if I want to work with multiple values, I use this bracket notation. So on line four, I'm telling Java that the variable multiple is gonna store not just one, but multiple values of type integer. Same thing down here with a character. So my variable one is storing one character, 
my variable all is gonna store an array of characters. Now, I haven't told Java yet how many I want to store in the array, and here's how I do that. So, on line two, this is similar to when I was using single variables. Variables. I'm both declaring on the left side and initializing an array. So I'm just saying the array is called multiple. It stores a series of integers. I have an int and then the bracket notation. And then on the right side, I'm initializing that array to store eight integer values. One of the nice things about Java arrays, and this is gonna come in handy today, is that they know how large they are. So this is my way down here. This is the special notation that I use to find out how many elements an array has. I take the name of the array, I add a dot, and then I add this special word length. So that will always return the number of elements that are stored in that array. And I can do, uh, and I can also split, like I did with variables, the declaration, which I'm doing for my character array down there on line six, with the initialization, which I'm doing on line eight. So I'm creating a character array called all, and after line eight executes, all has space to store four characters. I can assign values to an array when it's initialized using this syntax. This is review from last time. I'm not gonna go into it uh, in detail. Okay, so, and, and again, let me remind you about how we index values in an array. So computer scientists start counting at zero. That's how we operate. And there's, there's actually a really good reason for this that I'd be happy to explain on the forum or if somebody asks, right? Um, it has to do with how the data is actually stored in computer memory. But, this is how it works. So the first value in an array is the value at index zero, and here's how to access it. So here's how I can both get and set the value. I use this bracket notation. I start with the name of the array. In this case, the name is A. It's not a very good name for an array, but that's what we're using on this slide. I have two square brackets, and inside, I'm telling Java the index that I want. So here I can either get or set the first value of this array. What that means is that if I want the last value, here's how to do that. Okay, so now this is kind of interesting. I'm using uh, uh, sort of two features of the array. I'm using the fact that it has a length property. And then, this is important, right? So if I have an array that has length of four, what's the last valid index in that array? Three, not four, right? Zero is the first, one is the second, two is the third, three is the fourth. So don't let this trip you up. If you tried to access the value of a bracket a dot length, that would cause an error. We can, we can do that together in a minute. Okay, so here's an example. I'm initializing an array on line one. I'm declaring an array called twos, and I'm initializing it to store the first three powers of two, one, two, and four. Um, and then I can both uh, access and modify the values inside that array using the bracket notation. So on line two, I'm printing out the value of the first value stored in twos, which is gonna be one. Then I'm changing it to two, and then I'm gonna print off a couple of other values in the array. Okay. Any questions about this before we go on? This is important. Try it again. Did it work? Okay, well, we'll look at that after class. Is this, uh, it, can you guys run this example? Is this working? Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll have to, we'll have to talk later. Okay, so how can I, how can I make this make an error? You guys learned a little bit about errors today in, uh, in lab this week. So how do I make this make an error? I can cause this to have a problem, yeah. Yeah, let's, let's look at what happens if I try to access the value stored in twos, twos dot length, right? So first of all, let's print off what twos dot length is. So that's gonna be four, and I'll put this back in, okay? Sorry, it's three, and now let's try this. Okay, so I've, I've caused a runtime error, right? Because the array doesn't have an index three. There's lots of other indices it doesn't have as well. I can, you know, try to access the eighth value of the array, and that's not gonna work either, right? Um, you guys will probably start to see errors like this when you start to work on MP0, um, the first MP checkpoint, which we're releasing today. Okay, so, and again, here's, uh, this, this is the same thing I was just talking about. 
right? In this case, the array has size four, but the fourth indice refers to the fifth value in the array, which it doesn't have. So I have this one. So, we talked a little bit about this last time, but I want to return to this subject, which is that in Java, an array it has a fixed size. So how many people here have worked with Python before? Okay, yeah, great. So in Python, I can create a list and I could just add stuff to the end, add stuff to the beginning, add stuff in the middle, it's all fun, no problem, right? Um, and that's actually kind of cool, and we'll talk later about similar things that we can do in Java. But on some level, I shouldn't say on some level, in, on a very deep level, Python, uh, Java is actually a lower level language than Python, um, in the sense that Java is gonna expose us to some actual limitations of the computer itself. So in Python, every time you change the size of the list, there's actually a fair amount of work that has to go on to allow that to happen. In Java, arrays don't do this for us. When I declare an array, I have to tell Java how many items it's gonna store. And then I can't change that later. If I wanna put more things in the array, I have to create a new array, copy the old stuff over, and then work from there. But I can't change the size of the original array. This can complicate our programs, and that's why Java has similar data structures to lists that exist in other languages like Python, which we'll talk about later in the semester. Um, so it also has, oh, I gave it away. Um, it also has some interesting historical consequences, right? Fixed size arrays. So how many people here, just do a quick poll, have a net ID that ends with the number two? Okay, how about three? Oh, see, we're starting to get into the threes. What about four? Okay, a few fours, five. All right, who's got one higher than 10? Higher than 20? Higher than 30? Higher than 40? Tell me what it is. 74. <laughs> I won't ask what your net ID is, but I have some, I, I can guess a few things, yeah. All right, so why? Okay, why? So, so give me a, a like a more normal, so, so my name is Jeffrey Challen. Uh, my net ID is Challen. I had to fight a little bit to get that. I think I like bumped somebody. I feel bad, but not so much in retrospect, because the first one they gave me was terrible. Um, anyway, so what would be like a normal, net, like a, a more normal identifier? Like how many of you guys have a Gmail account that ends with the number 74, right? Maybe you were, no, you weren't born in 1974. Only, only I'm, I'm old. Uh, so why? Why is this the case? Doesn't seem to make any sense. What would be a more normal net ID? Maybe more r memorable. Maybe more easier to share with other people. You know, you're out, you know, at a party and someone that wants to, you know, it's like, hi, I'm TYPP55, right? You know, hit me later. Right? Um, you have to write that down. So, but what's a, what's a more normal way to do this? Who has a better proposal? There's so many better ideas. Yeah. Yeah, what about first name dot last name? How many people have a Gmail address that looks like that, kind of? Or maybe just first last, right? Yeah, why, why, why not that? That seems like it would work. So there's a, there's an interesting property that all of your net IDs have, without even asking you. I know something already about your net ID. Does anyone know what that is? Yeah. What's that? Oh, uh, no, mine doesn't end in a number. Some of you might, does anyone have one that does not end in a number? Ah, there we go, okay, see? There's a lucky person right there. Hopefully it's not like a string of consonants all in a row or something, yeah. They have to be unique, yeah, so that would cause lots of problems, right? It was like, who do I deliver this email to? Yeah, who cares, I'll just send it to both of you, right? That will cause some interesting things to happen. Um, they're all unique, I know that, but I know there's a property of them that I know. I can guarantee, yeah. They are all shorter than eight characters. Does anyone have one that's longer than eight characters? Does anyone have, it's exactly eight characters. Yeah, for some of you that two is the eighth character. So why? Okay, you just learned something about Java arrays. This is not a a uh, unique property of arrays in computer science. A lot of languages have this limitation. So why have we, d why do we have to work so hard? So the people that work in engineering IT actually have a, s a special program that they use to assign these net IDs. It takes your name as an input, 
and then it produces this terrible thing that they gave you to use, right? And along the way, it tries to do things like avoiding giving people names that have bad words in them and stuff like that, right? Uh, we don't always succeed. There are some examples that you can find on campus of uh, people that got fairly unfortunate net IDs assigned to them, right? Um, but but what, what's one limit? So they're all under eight characters, why? You, you can now under answer this question, yeah. Yes, because there's a computer program. This is an old computer program that is involved when you log in to your email, when you access certain accounts on campus. And when that computer program was designed, some program out there, a real person, and I'm sure they are probably in the witness protection program by now, um, but they decided that eight characters was perfectly fine as a limit for the size of your username, is what it's called. They made this arbitrary decision, probably back in the 1960s or 70s, maybe. And we are still living with the consequences today. I find this incredibly amusing, right? Like you guys, like 40 years later, still have these weird net IDs because some programmer, again, you guys are reading about the impact programmers have had on the world. Here's an example. Someone made this decision. I don't know if you could, go online and look around. Maybe you could find out who that person is, right? And send them a nice note. Um, they, pro they probably, it's probably first name dot last name at gmail.com, right? That's probably their email address. They're like, I'm not living with this. Um, anyway, so yeah, this is, this is the reason. There is an array somewhere on a program that runs, that handles your logins to various systems, and that array has a fixed size. The size is eight characters, so I can have a one character net ID, I can have a four character net ID, I cannot have a 10 character net ID because the array is fixed size. So now you know why we've got all the twos. I look forward to teaching into the generation of threes. I hope to be on campus when I ask how many people have a two and no hands go up because we've used up all the twos. They're gone, right? Uh, we're on to the threes. Some of you guys have threes already, so we're clearly getting there. So again, Java has other data structures that we can use to store this type of information that are more flexible. We will get to them. In fact, we will build some of them together, and you will see how they have to work with arrays. All of these data structures, at the end of the day, have to store data in an array. So they have to work around this limitation sometime, somehow. There's some clever ways to do that, um, and we'll talk about that in, in a month. So as we talked about last time, loops and arrays are, really go hand in hand when we're designing computer programs. I have data in an array, and frequently what I wanna do is I wanna go through that array one item at a time and do something to it. So maybe I have some uh, music in the array, a sample, and I wanna like modify that sample somehow to make it, you know, to auto-tune it, right? Or to, you know, uh, adjust the pitch to be higher or lower. This is how these programs work. Maybe the data in the array is a picture, all the little individual components of a photo. And what I wanna do is I want to uh, do some sort of filtering on it to make you look more beautiful or make the background look more professional or whatever, right? All these like cool little tools you guys have at your disposal now for your Snapchat and your Instagram and whatever you guys do online. Um, so here's, here's a very, sorry, I'm getting too excited, I'm getting ahead of myself. So here's the sort of canonical way to go through the items in an array, all right? So I have an array that I've declared on line one called primes. That array has seven, six values in it, first six primes. And then I have a loop. And here's how I set up the loop. And again, we talked about four. About 99% of the loops you write are gonna be for loops. And about 99% of those for loops, maybe 95%, are gonna look exactly like this, okay? I have an array right here, and I wanna go through and I wanna do something to every element. Maybe I want to find all the ones that are greater than the value and remove them, or maybe I want to modify each one, or maybe I want to print them, like I'm doing here, okay? So here's how this looks. I have a for loop. I have an index variable for my for loop. I started at zero. I run it up to just one less than the length of the array, because that's the last valid index for that array. And in each update of the for loop, I increment it by one. So the first time this for loop runs, I will be zero, and I'll print the first value in prime. The second time it runs, I will be one, and I'll print the second value in prime. The last time it runs, what will be the value of i? Think it through a little bit. Last time it runs, I will be five. 
5 is the last valid index of an array with 6 values. And I'll print the last prime, which is 13, and I'll be done. Java actually has a, a slightly uh, easier way to do this. This is known as the enhanced for loop. I think Java enhanced this for loop back in the 90s, but we're still using this term. Um, so here's, so I can essentially write this loop like this. So this is the same loop, and we'll look at both of them in a minute, but this is a different syntax for the for loop. So let's slow down and look at it together. So the, the array is the same. So I have an array called prime. It's an array of integers that has six values, and I've initialized it to store this first six prime numbers, two, three, five, seven, eleven, and thirteen. Here I initialize an index variable, and I use that index variable to access the values inside the array. Down here what I do is I say I'm gonna declare a variable that's gonna receive in every iteration of the loop the next value of the data stored in prime. You'll note that there's no index here, okay? So the advantage of the enhanced for loop is it's a little bit cleaner. The disadvantage is you don't have access to the index. So I don't actually know what the index is of the value that I'm looking at. And depending on what you're doing with your loop, this could be a problem. Uh, I was looking at the solution code for the first MP checkpoint, and there's some places where you can use an enhanced for loop, and there's some places where you can't because you actually need to know what index uh, what the index is of the piece of data that you're looking at during that iteration, okay? But this is another way to do it. All right, we're gonna do some examples, but any questions before we get to our, our playground time? Should be good. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's a, so that's a great, this, this is an important distinction. So when I use the enhanced for loop, prime doesn't get the index, it gets the value. So the first time this runs, prime is set to two. That's the first value in the array. The second time it runs, it's set to three. The third time it runs, it's set to five. It's not set to zero, one, two. Yeah. So it stores the data inside the loop, not the index. Great question. Yeah, Malcolm. Uh-huh. So, okay, so the question is, for you, for you people that know a little bit of Python, or for all of us, what's the difference between a list and an array? So, my, we'll, we'll come back and talk about lists. Like I said, that's actually one of my more fun parts of the semester. We're gonna build a couple of lists in Java. So you're gonna see how they are actually implemented, or a few ways to implement them. A list is like an array. A list has a couple of extra features. In a list, I can add items to it. So I can add an item to the end, I can add an item to the beginning, I can insert an item anywhere in the list. That requires changing the size, which I can't do with an array, right? Lists typically also have other features, like I can remove elements, right? Things like that, right? So a list, in some ways, is a generalization of an array. It's like an array, it stores a series of values, but it allows me to modify it um, in place, where an array actually allows me to modify the size where an array, uh, to. Let me try this again. To perform operations that would modify the size so that I can't do on the right. Does that, are you, will you accept that answer? Awesome, okay, yeah. We'll come back and talk about lists. It's a great example of how to build a data structure. Yeah. So arrays can be faster in certain cases, yeah. So the question was, <coughs> what's the advantage of using an array? Um, and we will, again, this is something we will talk about when we, when we implement some lists. Yeah. Arrays have advantages. They're, they don't just exist because, you know, we couldn't do better. Other questions? Yeah. The zero, the index zero in array is always the first value. Yeah. This is called zero indexing. So start to learn to think to start counting at zero. Yeah, yeah, we can do that in a minute. <coughs> so the question was, if I ran this code, what would it do? And the question, and the answer is, both of these loops would print all the values, and we will run something like this in just a minute. Yeah. Which one's more efficient? I think these are almost identical. Yeah. These two loops, I suspect that um, they are equivalent. Yeah, so the, the biggest trade-off here <coughs> between the two, and this is, 
you know, one of the things about being a programmer, right, this is a creative activity. When you guys are doing this, you will always be making trade-offs, right? There is never a right way to do most things. Anything that you can do that's interesting when you're writing code has many right ways to do it. And one of the things you spend a lot of time doing when you, when you start to write more complex pieces of code is, at least if you're me, is thinking and worrying about these decisions. Like, did I do that in the best possible way? Am I gonna regret that five minutes from now, right? And then five minutes from now, I'm like, oh, I am regretting it, I'm gonna go back and fix it, right? And then you end up fixing five other things, right? So here's the trade-off, right? The pro of the enhanced for loop is it's a little cleaner, right? The syntax is a little nicer. The con is I don't have access to the index, right? So I don't know what value I'm looking at. Same thing for the regular for loop. Regular for loop, I have access to the index. Con is I have to remember to index the array all over the place, right? So I get rid of these brackets down here, right? No brackets. That's nice. But I also don't know what I is. Yes, can I nest arrays? We will talk about that next week. Yeah, Java does have multi-dimensional arrays. Obviously, they're useful for storing all sorts of data. But one thing I want to remind you, remember, an array is an interesting data structure partly because it maps down very directly to what's actually happening in your computer, okay? So your computer stores everything as one huge array of numbers. So if you have a photo, right, that photo to you looks two-dimensional. To the computer, it's a single stream of numbers. If you have a movie, that movie is three-dimensional, right? That's a time dimension. To the computer, it's a single stream of numbers. <coughs> so when we work with data that is presented to a human in a higher dimension in any programming language, we always have to do something called flattening it in order to actually store it in the computer, right? You don't have to worry about that as a programmer. You can work it with it like it's two-dimensional or three-dimensional or four-dimensional or eight-dimensional if you want to, but internally, always stored as a single series of numbers. Great, these are great questions. I'm glad we're doing this. Yeah. Yep. Ah, so the question is, if the last valid index is primes <coughs> dot length minus one, why does my loop contain this constraint? Can anyone answer that question? What's that? Yep. Yeah, so you could write it as less than or equal to primes dot length minus one. That is not typically how it's done. I just want to point that out. They work the exactly same way. But again, this is the uh, for loop that you will be able to write in your sleep, right? At the end of the semester, I could probably send you down to the CBTF with a blindfold on and tell you I've got an array called foo and you could write this loop. Um, you know, but you, you will, all, I would suggest that you always write it this way. Right, this is sort of how it's done. I don't know why. Again, somebody else made this decision. It's a little cleaner, right? Uh, but again, you will just learn to recognize this as the loop that goes through every value in an array. It's a pattern, right? Other questions? All right, let's play with some, let's play with some examples. Okay, so, oh wait, I just wanna point something out. You guys are doing good. We're, we'll stop from time to time for a little bit of um, encouragement. Right, so um, I just wanna point out, uh, last year's class, so I'm definitely gonna pitch you guys against last year's class, right? Like, that's a natural thing to do, right? Um, so they got 94 on the first quiz. Not a particularly hard quiz, right? You guys, you know, did pretty well. Last spring, <coughs> 92%. Um, you guys, 92. All right, so you're two points down last fall. But that's probably okay. Right, everyone is, no one is gonna suffer because of this. But, but you guys are doing well, right? You guys did well in the CBTF. I know for a lot of you, this is a first real assessment at college, so I hope it went well. Uh, keep doing the homework, keep keeping up with things. You guys can do this class, trust me. I have seen hundreds of students now, probably thousands of students succeed at this course. Um, you guys will not be the last or the first. All right, so let's do some loops, okay? So let's, let's write this together. So I wanna print out every character in two print. And let's print them on separate lines, let's use our print line. <coughs> okay, so when you start approaching problems like this, it's useful to slow down and think a little bit about what you need to do, right? Okay, so who can, who can talk to me? Tell me a little bit about what needs to happen. Don't write the code, just 
describe in a sentence how I'm going to accomplish this. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to loop through the array. That's how I get to every element. And I'm going to print all the elements one by one. So I have two ways I can do this. I can use, let's do it with the normal for loop first. And, you know, one of the things I'm going to do is just, as we go through the semester, I'm just going to try to give you guys a sense of sort of how I work on problems like this, right? Um, so again, like this loop, you know, you have to be, you will get to the point where you can write in your proof. A lot of times when you're writing a loop, the first thing you want to do is just set the loop up. So you'll see here, I've written the loop, I've initialized the index, I used i. This is like the one place in your code where you're allowed to use a variable name that has a single letter. Everywhere else, no. In a loop, it's, it's traditional. I, if I have a loop inside a loop, I use J. If I have a loop inside a loop inside another loop, I use K. If you have more loops than that, come talk to me, because something's wrong. Um, but, but yeah, I is very, you can use index, but again, this is the one place where I will allow you to get away with using a single, uh, letter. Okay, so I've got my loop. Now what do I do? Actually, you know, I'm, I'm just getting started here, so let's do something simpler. Let's just print i. I just want to make sure that my code is actually, like, going through every value in every index properly. Okay, so, and this is something, again, when you're writing code, stop. Try things, right? Don't try to write it all at once. Write the smallest possible piece that you can figure out how to do, and then make sure that works. So now, at this point, I know that my loop is operating properly, because this array has four values, and I see it print index 0, 1, 2, and 3. Okay, so now I know the loop is right. And now I just need to adjust what's inside. So now I'm gonna use this variable i as an indice into my two print array. There it is. Questions about this? Again, when you guys are, when you guys are, you know, the, the computers are such fantastic uh, co conversants, right? Like, they're, they are, they're so interactive, right? Use that to your advantage. One of the biggest mistakes we see, particularly when people work on, you know, larger pieces of code, like the machine project you guys are gonna start today, is one of the biggest mistakes we see people make is they try to do too much at once without understanding what their code is doing. I still do this, write the smallest possible piece and get it to work. Then add a little bit more, get that to work. Then add a little bit more, get that to work. Use print statements to figure out what's going on. That's a really good way of finding out what your program is doing. Oh, let's do this, okay, well let's write this using the enhanced for loop, because this is a place where, you, where we can do that. Okay, so now I'm gonna, I need to change my loop. So now, do this, current letter to print, and then current letter. And again, like, look at examples, right? So, it, you know, sometimes I forget, like, what's the syntax of the enhanced for loop? So I'll go back, I'll find a little piece of code online, and like, oh, right, okay, that's right, it's got, you know, a colon, you know, here's the, you know, here's the initialization here, right? I've got a variable of the same type, I've got the array, I've got a colon in between them. Okay, that's, that's what I need to do. Okay, let's try this. Does the same thing. Great. All right. I'm gonna leave this as an exercise to the reader, figure out a different way to, to write this. Okay, here we go. So now let's, let's have some fun. Let's, let's, let's go through the loop backwards. Okay. So the first thing I'm gonna suggest, we can't do this with the enhanced for loop, because it only goes forward. That's because going backwards is kind of unusual. But let's, let's figure out how to do it. So let's write our original loop. This is a great chance for you guys to write this loop. So here's what we just wrote an instant ago, and we'll get that to work again. Okay, so now I've got it going through forward. What do I need to change to get it to go backwards? Yeah. So right now, I starts where? Well, actually, let's, let's go and pr just print I again until we figure out that our indices are right, and then we'll go back to using i in our bracket notation. So here I'm going 0, 1, 2, 3, 
So if I want to go backwards, where should I start? Yeah. Bingo. Yeah, so it starts at the last valid index for this array, which is to print dot length minus one, okay? Now, how should I update i every time? If I run this now, I'm gonna be in trouble. Well, actually, I, I think if I run this now, it's not gonna do very much. Let's see what happens. Yeah, if I run this now, it only prints one, okay? So clearly I have some other work to do, but I'm starting at the right spot, all right? What else do I need to change? Yeah. Yeah, so I've gotta go down. Okay, so now I'm gonna be in trouble, right? So now if I run this, uh-oh, okay? So, but, but I, I started well, right? You'll see I got the right answer, and then I just didn't know when to stop, right? So three, two, one, zero is what I want. When should I stop this loop? How should I stop this loop? Yeah. Yeah, and so, so typically how this is done is I, my condition is as long as i is greater than or equal to zero, continue. Because anything that's greater than or equal to zero is a valid index, I'm assuming, because I started at the right spot. So now I'm doing good, okay? And now all I have to do is go back and replace my indices with the right ones. Okay, good. Um, all right, again, I think I'm gonna leave this as an exercise for the reader, unless we uh, run, out of, run out of time. Okay, ah, so now we have a little bit of a, of a different challenge here, right? So this is our first, you know, so, so far we've just been printing stuff, right? Okay, now this is, this is tricky. All right, here's my proposal. Let's start by printing the values. So I'm gonna write a enhanced for loop that's gonna print every value in this array. So when in doubt, start with something that you know how to do, okay? So I know how to write an enhanced for loop that prints the values. Okay, so what do I need to change about this? I wanna sum them all up, okay? So the cr answer here when I'm done is going to be what? I'm terrible at math, 150. How do I do this? Okay. So the first thing I have to think about is that I wanna be able to print the sum here. After this, I'm gonna go through every value, I'm gonna be calculating, and then when the loop finishes, I need to be able to print the sum. So where do I need to declare this variable that's gonna store the sum? Can I declare it inside the loop? Yeah, so this is our first example of, of using, you know, sometimes what's called an accumulator or just a variable outside my loop, okay? What's the type of this variable that I need to use to store the sum? Why? Because it's an array of ints. If it was an array of doubles, I would use a double. In this case, I'm gonna use an int. I'm gonna say int sum is equal to zero. I'm gonna start it at zero. I should have asked you about that. But when I start adding up numbers, I start at zero, right? I start with nothing, okay? Now, what do I do? So let's print the sum down here. Let's just fill out that piece of code. Uh, System dot out dot println sum. Okay, so now I'm printing all the values and the sum is zero. So now what do I do? How do I finish this? Very close. So inside the loop, the first value I see is 10. What should the sum be after that iteration finishes? 10. The next value I see is 20. What should the sum be then? 30. So how am I modifying the sum every time? Yeah. Yeah, essentially I'm saying make my sum bigger by the amount that I'm looking at. So I'm gonna say sum is equal to sum plus current. One way to do it, we'll simplify it in a sec, okay? So now, let's print off both current and our sum. We'll do that this way. Uh, when we talk about strings, we'll talk about what this, the plus operator does with the string, but in this case, it's gonna print the two strings separated by a space, okay? Drag this up a little bit. Let's see what happened, okay? So the first time through, my current value was 10 and my sum was 30. The second time through, my current value was 20, the sum Sorry, the current value was 10 and the sum was 10 after I added it in. And so you'll see that the sum is increasing every time by the right amount. And when I'm done, it's correct. 
Awesome. So I'm going to make two final clean little cleanup modifications to this. I'm going to get rid of the print statement. So I've got the right answer, which is I wanted. And as somebody pointed out, there's a slightly more clever way to do this, which is I use this plus equals operator. It's exactly the same code, but this is a very common thing to do. I'm taking a value, and I'm increasing it by another amount. So now I'm saying every time through, add the value of current to sum. Let's make sure that still works. Good. Questions about this? Okay. So what we just did was our first example of writing something called an algorithm. And this is a topic that is going to consume us for a large part of the rest of the semester, something that we will continue to come back to. On some level, this is the deep conceptual heart of computer science. The reason you learn to program a computer is so that you can implement algorithms. And as you go through our program, one of the things that will happen is you'll become a better programmer. But part of the reason you will, and part of the reason you'll want to, is that the algorithms that you will be able to use will become more and more sophisticated. So look, when you upload a picture to your photo sharing site, and it recognizes that there's a picture of your cat in the photo, that's an algorithm. You know, when a self-driving car or a semi-autonomous vehicle makes small decisions about how to adjust its steering so that it stays in its lane, that's an algorithm. When, you know, we reach out to students in this class that might be a little bit behind, we're using an algorithm to identify. This is how your lives are organized and judged. When you apply for a job, there is an algorithm that's going to uh, run the first pass on your resume. When you try to get a credit card, there's an algorithm that is used to decide if you deserve a credit card and how much credit you should be given. When you buy things, there are algorithms that decide, is this a legitimate purchase? How likely is it that I suddenly bought, you know, three nights at a resort in the Bahamas, right? Um, this is the conceptual heart of computer science. This is what's exciting about our, our field. And the way that these algorithms are implemented is entirely using these simple building blocks that we've just discussed over the past two weeks. You know, we performing simple calculations, making decisions about what to do, um, you know, storing the results, making simple decisions, and doing those things over and over again. That's what leads from the array of data that's in the photo to the label cat. It's a very complicated, sophisticated, large number of these calculations, but at the end of the day, it's simple. I always bring myself back to this whenever I get frustrated with what I'm doing. At the end of the day, the computer is just a calculator that runs really fast, okay? Um, and it, was, it, it will not try to fool you. It may not always do what you want. It may rarely do what you want, um, but it's a deterministic thing, right? And at the end of the day, it's, it's running these simple things. So as I said before, computer algorithm, the word algorithm is heavily associated with the computer era. So one of the things that we're doing with computers now is we're actually mining text data to learn more about how words are used over history. And one of the things you can find out, here's the word usage of, here's the usage of the word algorithm. And this is by mining a bunch of texts that were collected over many years and digitized as part of, you know, various digital book product, uh, projects. And you can see, when does algorithms start taking off? 1960s. What was happening around that time? computers, all right? All right, so for the next simple weeks, what we're gonna be doing together is implementing algorithms. Simple algorithms, we're gonna talk about how to, you know, and, and this is something that is gonna be something you will uh, struggle with for a long time. One of the things I hear from students all the time in this class is, you know, I know how to solve the problem, I just can't get it into code. And so that's what we're gonna do together. The problems that we're gonna solve are not hard. Getting the computer to do them for you is what you struggle with when you're getting started with this, okay? All right, I'm gonna let um, us pick up here on, well, actually, you know what, hold on, let's do this, we have enough time, okay. So, let's say I have three numbers, and I want you to give me the maximum. What is an algorithm for solving this problem? So what's an algorithm? An algorithm is a series of steps that I, you should be able to write down that a computer should be able to take or a person should be able to follow very carefully and use to arrive at the correct result, okay? So I've got three numbers. What's one way to figure out which is the biggest? 
out of all three. Yeah. Well, that's how I'm going to build my algorithm. But no, when, when you describe an algorithm to me, I want to hear English. I want you to talk me through the steps. Yeah, way in the back. Yeah, you're off to a good start, right? So clearly I have to compare the numbers to each other, right? So let's start with three, okay? Let's start with three numbers. Is there a way that I can eliminate one of the numbers? Well, well, let's let's uh, let's imagine that um, let let's pick one and we'll test if it's the largest. So, in order to be the largest, what has to be true about the number? Right. Be bigger than both of the other numbers, right? Okay. So let's take a. Let's say we're doing a, b, and c, and I'll take a and I'll compare a to b and c. If a is bigger than both b and c, then what do I know about a? It's the largest number. If it's not, what do I know about a? It's not the largest number, okay? So now I took A and I compared it to both B and C. If it's bigger than both, A is, I'm done. A is my winner. If it's not, how many numbers do I have left to compare? Two, because A can't be the biggest. So now what do I do? Look at B and C. Pick one of them, compare it to the other. So I say, is B bigger than C? If B is bigger than C, then it's my maximum. If not, what's the maximum value? It's a series of steps, and you can actually do this with any number of numbers, right? So again, I'm going to determine if first is the largest by comparing it with all the other numbers. If it is, I'm done. Otherwise, it's not the largest. Therefore, I don't ever have to think about it again. I've made the problem smaller. Just compare the second and the third. So I will leave this for you guys to do, because I have an important announcement to make. All right, so we are in the process of releasing MP0. In fact, I'm going to do that, like, right now. While we're talking, um, all right. So that'll be up on the website in a minute. So this is a big moment for the class, and I want to take a minute to talk about what's about to happen. Your lives are over. Uh, no, just kidding. Um, so if you haven't seen something like this before, so you're going to check out. You're gonna, you know, some of you will be very excited to start this, and I hope you are because I hope you actually take advantage of office hours this weekend to get going. All right, so you have just over two weeks to finish this, the first checkpoint. Now, some of you are gonna get this code and your brains are gonna explode, okay? Um, there is a lot here. It is complicated. It is frightening if you've never seen this stuff before. This is normal, okay? The homework problems in this class are the little bite-sized pieces that are designed to make you feel comfortable and build you up slowly but surely. The machine project is the big, gnarly piece of stuff that's designed to make you feel uncomfortable. It is not that much harder. When you are done with the first checkpoint, you will be astonished at how little code you wrote, okay? It's like 20 lines total. I did it last night. But you will be frustrated by how much digging and searching around you had to do throughout what we're about to give you to find what you needed to do. And that is normal for this part of the class. These MPs can be intimidating when you get started, but don't freak out. Come to office hours, ask for help on the forum. You guys will do this, trust me. And this is really exciting because this is the beginning of a journey that we're gonna go on for the next couple of months, all right? We're gonna give you a little help with this in lab next week, but please get started this weekend. We have office hours today, we have office hours Saturday and Sunday, okay? One last thing, I wanna, and this is important, so this is our chance to talk about this. We have a minute, okay? Some of you have noticed in the syllabus, we're doing something new this semester, which is that every M part of the MP, there will be two deadlines. Half of you, how many people here have labs that start before 3 p.m.? Raise your hand. Okay, you guys are, I can't remember what the, what the names of the groups are. You guys are either the blue, you're the blue group, I think. You have Sunday deadlines from now until the, until the machine project is over. How many people have labs that start at 3 p.m. or later? All right, you're the orange group. You have Monday deadlines from now till the end of the semester. Okay, calm down. Let's talk about this. I'm gonna explain to you why we're doing this. The number one reason that we made this choice, I'm happy to talk about this on the forum, I'm happy to talk about it on Reddit, wherever. 
right? The number one reason we made this choice is to provide you with better support. Office hours get really crowded around deadline time, and by dividing you in half, it means that everybody is gonna get more help when they need it. But this is not something, um, again, I'm happy to explain this, I'm happy to discuss the implications of it, um, but this is how things are gonna work from now until December, all right? I will probably not be here on Monday. In fact, I will almost certainly not be here on Monday. I have some family business to attend to. I think either we will post a video lecture or Ben will be here. Um, but I will probably see you guys again next week. Enjoy the MP and have a great weekend.